What's up guys, it's Delmata here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Necrit video on the League of Legends MMO. So, the last one we reacted to was talking about Runeterra, the, basically the world of League of Legends, and how the map is already set up in a way that you basically have a core game and then at least four or five expansions already set out as possible expansions if they kind of follow the World of Warcraft model. And I honestly found it very intriguing, very entertaining. I I have played League of Legends before, but I never really got hardcore into it, but I am, you know, I've played a fuck ton of WoW. Um, so, obviously, you know, the MMO genre is something I'm interested in. You know, it would be interesting to see a game uh, that is able to really compete with WoW in terms of longevity. Obviously, right now, you have Final Fantasy XIV that's very popular, um, but it's only been out for, you know, a couple of years, and it's already had an entire revamp because the first version was so bad. Um, so, you know, maybe in a couple of years, Final Fantasy will be that game. But if not, when League of Legends MMO finally does come out, Riot's MMO finally comes out, hopefully it can be that, you know, alternative to WoW on the same scale and time period that WoW is on. Anyway, this is Necrit's The Real Reason Riot's MMO is Set Up for Success. Link to the original video down below and let's jump into it. I already made four MMO videos and at the end of the last one, I said that would be my last one. Because up until that point, I was simply showing people what already exists. Going past that point would be pure theory crafting. But no one said I can't talk about something that people already talked about. Okay, not entirely. You see, a lot of people mentioned some good and big reasons why Riot's MMO is set up for success. I will repeat some of those points in this video. But the reason why I decided to talk about this topic as well is because as someone who has been with Riot Games for over a decade, I know their patterns of behavior. I know their entire past when it comes to monetization and that means all the good stuff and the bad stuff. And that means nothing as any Blizzard fan will tell you because they could get bought out by Activision and then bought out by Microsoft and then everything changes. I know their past when it comes to their game's success. And I know what they do when things don't go well. And some of these points tell us a lot about how Riot's MMO is shaping up. On top of all of this, Canon had the exclusive interview with Ghostcrawler, where we got quite a few golden nuggets. Which includes a line that pretty much tells us that, yeah, Riot is gonna go through with the MMO. One of the nice things about Riot is we're, we're not going to run out of money, right? I'm, I'm not going to have a publisher that's like, hey, if you, you know, you got to ship by Christmas or, or, or we're canceled. Mm. Um, Riot will cancel this game if the game isn't good enough. They're not going to cancel the game because it gets too expensive. And those... This sounds great. So after combining all of this, suddenly I have a new topic to talk about. The real reason why Riot... That's not necessarily a good thing either, as you know, anyone who's seen the massive amount of money that was dumped into the Lord of the Rings. Like, uh, the Rings of Power, or whatever it's called, the new Amazon series. Money does not necessarily mean good. Riot's MMO is set up for success. Let's start with all the things that we already know about. Perhaps the biggest reason for Riot being on the right path is already having a loyal following. True. When World of Warcraft launched for the first time, there were lines forming up around entire blocks. And why was that? Well, first of all, it's because digital purchasing was not a thing. But more importantly, because people knew the Warcraft universe from the other games. And they knew Blizzard as a great developer. Oh True, and yeah, what happened there? Now, uh, to be fair, the, the, you know, the I think Activision took over, I want to say halfway through Wrath of the Lich King, something like that, um, which is why the first three expansions are so fondly remembered. Uh, but yeah, like the Warcraft series was already incredibly popular, especially Warcraft Three. Warcraft Three was fucking huge, so that you know them having and, and and like huge, not in a way like League is though. League is way bigger than Warcraft Three is. Gaming is just far more popular nowadays than it used to be, right? Um, gaming up until probably the mid to late 2000s was still kind of a niche thing for anyone over like 10 years old, whereas now it's super mainstream. Um, but yeah, like Warcraft 3 was one of the most popular games back then. Uh, anyway. Of course, Riot is riding the same wave. Hopefully with a different destination. <laughs> People know League's universe from League of Legends. 
and Riot is essentially where Blizzard used to be. They are known for their great games, exactly as Blizzard used to be. They are known for taking a game idea, polishing it and making it better than its inspiration. Exactly as Blizzard used to be. Speaking of which, if you're a fan of MMOs and you don't know much about Riot Games, you might be surprised to see all the successful games they have released. Of course, League of Legends launched as the better, simpler version of the Dota mod from Warcraft 3. Nearly 10 years later, Riot launched their second game, Teamfight Tactics, which was a new version of the auto chess from Dota 2. And once again, using characters people already know and love from League, Teamfight Tactics dominated its competition. And it now remains as the only big and still growing auto chess game on the market. Then we got the third game, a card game using League's characters called Legends of Runeterra. From all of the Riot's games, Legends of Runeterra is the only game that didn't fully dominate its game genre. That's because card games already have a very narrow audience. And digital card games slowed down their growth. But on top of that, it is hard to pull someone away from their card game if they already spent money on it. However, despite that, Legends of Runeterra still managed to match Hearthstone. So these two are still battling for dominance with the... Oh, how old is this video? Two months old? I'm pretty sure... Let's see, um... Let's, let's go to Twitch and check this out. Maybe I'm wrong here, but uh, let's see. Legends of Rune Terra. 600 viewers. Um, Hearthstone, 21k. Uh, what was the other one he mentioned there? Uh, it was the auto chess one. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, Team Fight Tactics. Team, Team Fight Tactics is still big. Okay, so Team Fight Tactics has been a success. They're, I was gonna say Legends of Rune Terra. I know that game is not doing as well as Hearthstone because Hearthstone's sometimes more popular than WoW. Uh, and although to be fair, you can't use entirely uh, Twitch viewership off of stuff. Some games just don't do well for live viewership. Like there's some games that are huge on YouTube but not huge on Twitch. There's some games that have massive player bases like Civ Six, but if you go on like you know. Twitch, they usually have like 300 viewers, despite the fact that it's always one of the top 10 most played games on Steam. So it doesn't always translate one to one. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if Hearthstone, you know, if you're comparing apples to apples, like Hearthstone to Legends of Runeterra, I feel like, you know, there, there's going to be a, a considerable overlap in their viewership. Uh, and clearly, Hearthstone's got, you know, 40 times the viewership. The other card games being very close. After this, we got Valorant, a new player-friendly version of Counter-Strike. Or at least new player-friendly compared to Counter-Strike. Which is also using iconic characters for marketing. Even this game managed to dominate the tactical shooter genre. And now it is doubling the numbers of their two main competitors. Rainbow Six Siege and Counter-Strike. But then... I don't think that's true either. Um, let's see... Yeah, it's CSGO right now literally has twice the viewership that Valorant does. Again, viewership's not everything, but... Valorant is huge. Valorant is undeniably huge, but it's not bigger than Counter-Strike. After Valorant, Riot went back to MOBAs. They looked at Mobile Legends Bang Bang. So yeah, now, I, like I was saying, I, I don't think viewership is everything, right? Obviously, there's a lot of games that don't have massive viewerships, but they are crazy popular. Um... But when you're comparing apples to apples, like games that are basically the exact same type of game, or like again, RTS games generally don't do well in viewership, even though they have a like a lot of them have massive player uh, bases. 4X does even worse in viewership, even though they have massive player bases. Um, but if you're comparing apples to apples, like Counter Strike to Valorant, Valorant did have a massive peak at one point uh, when it was like new and fresh and whatever. But yeah, Counter Strike is still by far the bigger game. Counter Strike's at this point probably the biggest shooter in the world. It's, it's even consistently above Fortnite, which for, the like, when Fortnite came out, 2016, 2017? I mean, I guess 2015, but, like, the Battle Royale is 2017, I think. Uh, Fortnite's been the biggest, was the biggest BR slash shooter for most of the last five years, but even, you know, over the last year-ish, year and a half-ish, it's started to die down a little bit, um, and you've really seen, you know, Counter-Strike rise to the top again. 
that's the real name by the way, they realized it was essentially a League of Legends on mobile, and they realized, why don't we do that, but better? And so Riot released League of Legends Wild Rift, a mobile version of League of Legends, which in many ways could be regarded as even better than League of Legends on PC. I mean, look at all those polygons. That's running on a phone. On top of that, even though it is a mobile game, it is using fairly standard monetization. And right now, while Wild Rift is dominating in the West, Mobile Legends Bang Bang is still dominating in the East in some countries. So Riot is currently in the process of dominating the game genre. But Riot did not end here. They recognized that people wanted to play more games with their League of Legends characters. And so they launched Riot Forge, a smaller publishing studio that is working with indie developers to make games with their IP. And here we already got two games. Hextech Mayhem is a League of Legends spin on the rhythm-based bitrunner, a 30-minute game which I have about 10 hours in, and Ruined King, which is about 40-hour long RPG that is telling a canon story from the universe. Also, you can find me here. You may simply call me Necrit. That's me! But in 2023, we are also <laughs> expecting two more games. Song of Nunu... I'm guessing he named himself after a character in the game which seems to be an adventure platformer taking place in the harsh Freljord, and Convergence, a 2D action platformer in Piltover that seems to be lining up really well with Arcane 2. Both of these games were delayed from 2022 to 2023. Because... guess what? No, it's not crunch time. It's because Riot Games actually care about their games with the two already released Riot Forge titles scoring 80% and 90% of overall positive feedback. So the takeaway from this is, yes, Riot has a history of nearly flawless game releases. They have not seriously flopped yet. And their monetization practices are not too far away from this. In Canon's interview, Ghostcrawler straight up mentioned they will not sell player power. We're not going to do pay to win. We're not going to do pay to power. I'm pretty confident saying that. Um, what oh, the best? That's, best big. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I probably said that, or a lot of players. Miss it. It's just not riots. Uh, right. We really want players to feel like they're welcome back in the game at any time. And yeah, if, if life is rough right now and you're between jobs or you just can't, you know, you can't pay for the. Don't don't they allow you to buy characters in that game? I know you can also unlock them, but still, that's technically pay to win. I mean, I always find, that, like, uh, maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe they don't allow you to buy characters, but I thought they allowed you to buy, like, a currency that would allow you to unlock all characters instead of actually, you know, unlocking them. Because that's kind of like the same argument that, like, WoW tries to make. Where, like, oh, yeah, I mean, like, technically you can buy WoW tokens, but it's not pay to win because, you know, you could just not buy WoW tokens and grind the gold. It's like, uh, yeah, that's pay to win, man. Like, it's just not mandatory. Um... But well, it is and it isn't, right? Because you see, like all the world first guilds do it. But yeah, it's that uh, not pay to win my ass. The subscription, I'd, I'd rather them not, you know, not churn out rather than be able to keep playing. So that's why Riot has traditionally liked uh, free to play with purely cosmetic purchases. As you heard, Ghost Crawler didn't even approach it. Okay, am, am I wrong about that? I th I swear you were able to buy characters, like. You, I know you can unlock them, but I thought, like, there was... Maybe I'm th thinking of a different game. But I thought, like, you had a certain... Like, you had the characters and you had to unlock them um, based on, like, you know, you got some in-game currency, but you were also able to purchase them. Now, obviously, if you're putting thousands of hours into the game, that's not pay to win. But... <laughs> this is one thing I find, like, really fucking funny. Is like people say, oh, it's not pay to win. You just have to put thousands of hours into the game to unlock something that somebody could have paid twenty dollars for. How's that not pay to win? As big news, he just casually dropped this piece of info because that's a given at Riot Games. Now I know what you might be thinking. In the past, some other developers from some other studios said they wouldn't do it until the moment they did it. So what makes this different for Ghostcrawler? 
Well, you see, this is simply how Riot operates. And if you need a proof, look no further than Riot's future game known as Project L. Project L is a league-based fighting game, and Riot is making sure... The fighting game genre is yet another genre dominated by Riot Games. And in their latest dev update, they mentioned the exact same thing. We want you to be able to play, no matter where you live, what your skill level is, or how much money you have to spend on a game. To that, I'm happy to confirm that Project L will be free to play. If you've played a Riot game before, this probably won't come as a surprise. Our team is made up of fighting game veterans and folks who are passionate about serving the FGC. And we operate with one approach. If we wouldn't like it, we won't do it. So yeah, uh, again, this... Maybe I'm just a lot more jaded than a lot of these fans are, but like this idea that like it's not pay to win. Maybe their fighting game won't be. Maybe. Um, but again, I'm pretty sure League kind of is. right. You can pay to unlock stuff. Now again, if you're a hardcore player... There's not m more you can unlock after you've unlocked everything, so maybe that's why these people don't consider it pay to win, but like, for an average player, that is pay to win. When it comes to monetization, we promise to be respectful of both your time and your wallet. Respectful of both your time and wallet. Theoretically, this doesn't exclude buying power. Anyway, what this means is that Project L will most likely run exactly like League of Legends. You play the game for free to unlock fighters, but you can also buy them directly. Now, be That's literally fucking pay to win, bro. That is literally pay to win. <laughs> bro. <laughs> the copium. The copium you hear from these fans, man. It's like, yeah, you, maybe you, right? Your job is literally to make YouTube videos and play and play video games. Yes, for you, thousands of hours on a game is no big deal because it's literally your job. But for fucking, you know, fucking Bob, who's, who's you know, got to work fucking, you know, eight to ten hour shifts, come home, he's got maybe an hour or two of gaming, uh, and then he's got to, like, help, you know, make dinner and take his kids to fucking soccer practice, and then he's got to come home and, you know, hang out with his wife for a bit and then go to bed. It will take him literally years to unlock that. Or, or, he can just buy it. Right? He can pay to win. Of course they mentioned that they will be respectful of your time. Hopefully the grind won't be that awful. I assume it will be something similar to Valorant where you can unlock each new character every week. Not one character per month as some games are doing it now. I mean, it's the same studio, they can just pass over the numbers and see what worked. And because they mentioned your wallet, I assume the skins won't be as pricey as... Valorant. Speaking of which, let's talk about the overall monetization at Riot Games and what it means for Riot's MMO. Besides the indie titles, which are standalone games, every Riot game is a free-to-play game, which run on skins and time-saving monetizations. Now, when I say time-saving monetizations, you may jump... You may mean pay to win. ...to the conclusion that even time-saving is indirectly buying power. However, that really depends on what you are buying, and in Riot's case, I can confirm it is not pay to win. But before... The fucking copium, man. The fucking copium. Bro. Man, I swear, fans like this, you could fucking give them a piece of shit, paint it gold, and convince them it's a fucking gold nugget. Before we get to... And, like, you know, League's a fun game. I've played it a little bit. It's a fun game. But this is 100% pay to win. Right? That, let's quickly talk about the skins. In League, Riot struck a good balance, with most champion skins being between 5 and 10 bucks. With the vast majority of them having unique spell effects. And occasionally you can buy the massive 20 bucks skins, which change up the entire animations of the champions. All of that is fairly standard, nothing crazy here. But I have to say, as I mentioned in my last video, it seems like Riot is shifting their focus away from League. But while their focus is going to the other projects, they have to keep the monetization going. 
So these days, League is actually getting less gameplay content than we did a few years ago. But we are still getting the same amount of skins. This means that because the vast majority of the content is skins these days, it seems like skins are dominating everything else. And I find it funny that you can connect this to what Ghostcrawler said in the interview about monetization. Mm. To look at League of Legends, for example, if we stopped making champions and just kept making skins, at some point players are like, well, this kind of sucks. You're only focused on the money making side right. of the game. So you need to do both. You need to make sure the game balance is good. You need to update Absolutely. everything that you can in order for players to feel good about it. Yes, it kind of feels like League is in this situation right now. In Teamfight Tactics, you can do the same thing. You can buy a skin for a little commander on the battlefield which you control, which is called Little Legend. These are always on the cheaper side. With some more expensive alternatives, which also have unique execute animations when you defeat an enemy. However, every Little Legend also has a legendary variation, which you can only get from eggs. And eggs are essentially loot boxes. And the amazing thing is, the TFT team realized that these loot boxes are bad. And after their first year, they allowed you to buy any little legend directly. Of course, it is possible that government with their anti-gambling pressured them into this. But as far as we know... Oh, 100% they did. They saw the writing on the wall and knew they needed to change before that was happening because there's a lot of countries that are starting to ban a lot of countries a lot of states within the u.s um that are in talks or have actually banned loot boxes and games and if you and if you uh don't take them out of your game it automatically game it makes your game a uh, a or a for adult rating because it's gambling there were no lawsuits and they did it themselves and since people trust them on this if anything it shows you their reputation TFT also offers their Battle Pass, which to this day has perhaps the best value out of any pass in any game. However, Teamfight Tactics also has the Arena skins. Because these are a massive chunk of landscape, of course they are a bit pricier than normal models. But the unfortunate part is that sometimes they also offer the Legendary Arenas, which go for up to $200. And I say up to because these arenas are a randomized drop. It is guaranteed to drop from egg number 60, which is around the $200 mark. But since you can get it earlier, you are essentially rolling for a discount. When Riot first announced this, I was shocked. I simply didn't expect it. But then, Mordog, the lead TFT developer, talked about it on his stream. And I realized I was wrong. Because TFT is so free to play, by which I mean you can't go more free to play without giving people money back. I mean, while in other games you grind for new characters or something like that. From the moment you log into TFT, everything is unlocked and you get the full experience. Even in League, that's not the case. Because of that, he mentioned that there are people who want to spend money on TFT, but they can't. Because in this game, you only have one little legend, so you technically only need one skin. Once you have the one skin you like, you don't need anything else. So, the team wanted to give the whales some food to support the game. And if you still feel like this was a greedy move, just listen to what Mordog has to say about it. For context, he is gonna mention Kai'Sa, and Kai'Sa is one of the $200 skins. At Pokestars Casino, I can find- Bro. <laughs> Does this guy hear what he's fucking saying? <laughs> People wanted to pay money for the game. You know, it was a free game. They got one skin. They were done. But they, they wanted to pay money. So we added, you know, like these $200 customization options. <laughs> uh, this guy, like... His last video was really good. But this one is him just fucking slobbing all over Riot's cock. Like, he is just fucking taking that whole thing, deep-throating it as fucking far as it can go, and he's, like, grabbing that ass and trying to get it more in there. Obviously, TFT has to make money to succeed, right? And so we have these expensive cosmetics that people want. That being said, uh, if you don't have money, it can feel left out, and I agree with you. So, typically what you have to do is you have to look for the opportunities to find something kind of comparable, and there will be opportunities. You're not going to be able to get everything, 
but for example during events there's going to be ones that are more accessible you might get lucky and get one during an egg um it's also the kind of thing where like let's say you really like dragon chibi mancer kaisa who knows in two years it may come back in a thing that's a promotion and be a little easier to get you know as time as goes on you never know and so you have to find your your moment where you can get the thing you enjoy rather than you know you have to have the new now and unfortunately like a lot of things in life money counts and it sucks when you don't have money it really does and i know that i've been there so man the dev is literally being more honest about the necrit is like the the dev is just straight up saying yeah you know it costs money because we have to keep this operation afloat like sorry guys it's what it is 100 percent right Necrit's like, oh, yeah, you know, people just wanted to spend money, so we fucking gave them ways to. <laughs> like, bro. That's my honest answer. Hopefully that was genuine enough. I have never seen a dev so open about a massive, almost corporate-level game. But yes, if anything, this shows you that Riot is trying to be fair about their prices. Lastly, when it comes to skins, we have to mention Valorant because Valorant is perhaps their most aggressive monetization. There, a normal recaller of a gun is about 10 bucks, That's with a full new gun. model going for about 20. On top of that, melee weapons, so for example knives, are double the price. So, for a unique model on a knife, that would be $40. Jesus and on top Christ. of that, sometimes you get bundles of special weapons with unique finishers that go that for up too. to $100. Jesus the logic Christ. Behind this price Jesus Christ. Jesus. Sweet Jesus. $100 for a single cosmetic in game. Well, I guess technically it's a pack of cosmetics, but still, that's insane. I think is that for each gun, you are only going to buy one skin. So once you buy a skin, you are unlikely to get another one. There is no gambling involved anywhere around Valorant. It is very much unlike Counter-Strike. So at least the monetization is not predatory per se. That said, it is still pretty high. Now that was all. Bro. They're charging you $100 for your gun to look slightly different. And you're saying it's not predatory. I mean, I, I half agree with that in a sense. In like the sense of, you know, you get what you fucking pay for. But still, like, it's, yeah. All the notable skin monetization. That's insane. It's fairly high. standard and sometimes the prices can go higher. However, remember, we are still talking about purely free-to-play games. So, let's talk about the potential pay-to-win. For Riot, the worst offender of this could be skipping grinds and buying characters. We can find this in League of Legends. Yeah, so literally paying to win. Legends of Runeterra and Valorant. No. In Legends of Runeterra, you can buy cards. But no one ever does that, because the game gives you so many free cards, you really don't have to do anything. In fact, the game is notoriously so fair, it is struggling to make money. In Valorant, you can unlock a new character every week if you really grind. Realistically, it is a new character every two weeks. And in League, you can buy champions directly, which could have been translated into power in the past. However, unlike in Overwatch, where picking heroes in the middle of the game can decide the game, and where the game is balanced around counterpicking, in League, that's not really the case anymore. A few years back, the game was balanced around hard counterpicking being a thing. But these days, Riot is trying to make sure that's not a thing for a very obvious reason. Unlike in Overwatch, in League, you lock in your champion for an entire game. So if you get hard counterpicked, you are not gonna have fun for the next 30 minutes. To combat this, Riot is slowly removing hard counterpicks from the game. And now you may have a slight advantage, but in general, any champion can win against any champion. Not at the highest levels. In any game. There's always a meta. I, I, we, I, I forgot to do, I think, two or three videos like this. Not like this, but like about like meta games and like balance versus fun. You have two options, balance or fun. Uh, and if, it, it, unless everything plays the exact same, there is going to be a meta. Right? It, it's impossible to get around. You can't balance a game, maybe for the average player, right? Because, you know, 
like, like a good example of this, like I've said before, is Warcraft logs. If you look at like the current Warcraft logs for, uh, you know, you know, like raiding, the difference between like the top class and spec and the bottom class and spec is only like ten to twenty percent, right? Not a massive, massive difference. But if you look at the uh, top one percent of players and you look at the difference between the top spec and the and the worst spec, it, it's like nobody is playing the worst one, and like half the players are playing the best one. Because when you when you get to the highest level of any game and you really have to start getting into meta gaming, that small one, two, three percent increment is a massive, massive deal. Because of this, if you look at the players at the very top of the ladder, you may realize that all of them are playing one champion. Yeah. So in League, if you buy a champion, you don't buy power. Because owning other champion won't affect how your game is going but you buy the option to try out other characters. With that said, I should mention that Lee... You can literally buy the best character in the game with money, but that is not buying power. Now, I, obviously this isn't going to make you a fucking world-class like eSport athlete, just buying that character, but when it is the best character in the game and you can literally purchase it with money, that is literally paying to win. League currently has over 160 champions. And the game is giving you a lot of champions for free to compensate. And again, it is free to play. But there is one more thing I need to mention. While Riot is built on a strictly not pay to win monetization. There cope, was a time cope. when you could buy power. This dark age will scare even the most powerful veteran players. Of course, I'm talking about runes. Yeah, for the first seven years in League's history up until 2017, besides buying champions... I didn't even know they didn't have these things in the game anymore. That's a long... It's been since I've played fucking League of Legends. <laughs> with the in-game currency, you also had to buy runes. Runes were basically sockets. They gave you tiny bonuses like 0.1 attack damage or 1% crit. Of course, 1% crit was ridiculously overpowered, because all you needed was that one rune that gave you 1% crit chance. Because by default, everyone had zero. So in the early fights, what would happen if you had the tiny chance to win the lottery and crit them? Well, you would essentially decide the early fights. So of course, everyone always had at least one 1% crit rune. Anyway, the problem with these was that you needed a lot of runes to fill a rune page, with one full rune page being equivalent to one champion of the highest cost. But also, you couldn't customize the page before each game started. You had to set them up ahead of time, and then when you were picking champions, you would lock in one of the pages. By default, the game gave you three rune pages. So usually you would set up one for attack damage, one for ability power, and one for tanking. But what if you wanted to play a support who needs mana regeneration? Well, you had to buy an extra page, with each new page costing the value of yet another new champion, or 5 bucks. Basically, this would be equivalent to buying dual spec in WoW, except you could buy it with real money, and you needed it 5 times. So what did Riot do? Did they lower... So kind of like WoW now? <laughs> they had a fucking WoW... To Pretty sure they added WoW tokens to Classic, didn't they? Or was that just Classic in the Chinese servers? I never really got hardcore to Classic. I, play I think I played to like level 16. And then I was just like, yeah, I'm just gonna go back to retail. The price to make the system a bit more fair? No, they removed it entirely because pay to win is not what Riot does. The reason why it was in the game in the first place is because it was an idea from 2009. Back then, they didn't even know how they wanted to monetize their game. So they were trying out random things. Anyway, as you can see, even when Riot gets close to pay to win, they always steer away from it. They know how bad the impact can be. And their normal monetization formulas are working, so why would they damage it? Now, this entire time, I pretty much talked about things that everyone else talked about as well. The three big factors steering the course of Riot's MMO. Number one being people attracted to the IP. Number two being monetization that is nearly guaranteed to be fair. And number three being the fact that Ghostcrawler mentioned that the team working on Riot's MMO is stacked. Anyway, besides these three points, there is also 
a hidden fourth one. And it's a big reason why Riot's MMO is set up for success, and I'm not joking. It's something no one talked about because everyone is focused on the gameplay. But I strongly believe this one might affect how Riot's MMO rolls out. You see, League has been selling skins for 13 years now. That is 13 years of gathered data. Data which can be applied to the MMO. They know what skins sell and what don't. Sexy women, badass men. They know which aesthetics are appealing and which are not. But most importantly, they have skin lines in League that people love. And these could be ported over to the MMO. Now, if you don't play League and you don't know what I'm talking about, let me explain. Instead of just giving random champions random skins, Riot likes to connect skins together and make them part of the same alternative world. For example, there is the High Noon alternative universe. And champions who share the same High Noon skin can be cowboys, clockwork angels, demons from the Wild West and people corrupted by demons. They all share the same thematic and together they make up an aesthetic that people get attached to. So what happened over the years is that Riot made skin lines that people love. And every time a new skin from that skin line is released, it is an instant success. And of course what they can do is that they can take these successful skin lines and sell them as transmog in the MMO. If you consider the fact that they have 13 years of customer data about purchasing skins, they are set up for success if they decide to sell premium transmog. Because they know what transmog is gonna be popular. What's even cooler is that even though they didn't give us the exact order, Riot confirmed 5 of their most popular skin lines. So now let me show you what might potentially appear in the in-game shop. Again, there is no particular order, but first there is the project skin line. This one is an absolute classic. It is a futuristic skin line with energy, blades and guns, as well as some really deadly robots. Also kind of like trash. KDA. The success of this skin line is driven by the popularity of their virtual K-pop band. The songs were a massive hit and of course these skins were too. Oh, of so course. this one seems like easy money. Though I'm not sure how my Fraliordian Barbarian is going to be wearing one of these. Next there is also Darkstar. A skin line around dark cosmic entities that, that are cool. destroying worlds. The vast majority of these skins are stunning. And I have to point out that Darkstar Jin is one of the best selling skins in the history of League. Then we also have Spirit Blossom, a skin line released with an awesome visual novel inside League of Legends. Meh. This one is themed around Eastern Legends. However, this skin line is also unique. Because this skin line portrays mythical stories that Ionians believe in in the canon <coughs> universe. So Basically it's all weeb shit. That's what I've noticed. You've got like fucking Gundams. You've, you've got... Literally a K-pop band, and then you've got fucking Eastern, fucking East Asian, uh, you know, medieval stuff. So in a way, these skins are canon. <laughs> it's just that the champions are not themselves as champions, they are portraying the mythical stories. And lastly, there is the Star Guardian skin line. What originally started as a Sailor Moon knockoff, eventually became its own universe <clears> with <throat> some very cool stories. The so it's literally four out of five of them are just weeb shit. <laughs> Star Guardian universe is perhaps the most popular one, with Star Guardian Jinx also being one of the best selling skins ever. So this one would be an easy moneymaker too. But this time no we have two ears. male champions here, although it would still probably look weird on my barbarian. But that is it for all the things I wanted to talk about. There was one more point, however, that point kinda crumbled. You see, I wanted to mention that while Riot Games is running their games in the West, in the East it was ran by Garena. Which meant that as the West had their normal monetization, Garena could use the Eastern monetization in the East, and the two basically had their own ecosystems. However, a few weeks ago, Riot just cut off Garena entirely and they decided to operate League of Legends in the East themselves. What's funny Smart is that move. Blizzard kinda tried to do the same thing, but Blizzard is not able to run their own games in the East. So while they also cut off their own Chinese publisher, because they can't publish it themselves, 
WoW is just gone. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. what I wanted to mention originally... <clears throat> That's been a huge debacle lately. Um, you know, NetEase basically released a, a WoW ripoff clone. Literally, they have, like, Deathwing and everything. It looks so fucking funny. But, uh, and they, they destroyed the statue of Garrosh live on stream. And they're, they have, apparently there's, like, something over there where, like, green tea is associated with, like, somebody who's two-faced, like, sweet on the outside, but, like, I'll stab you in the back. Um, which I find kind of ironic, you know, that a Chinese company that's run by the CCP was saying that about Blizzard, as true as it is about Blizzard, that's like, you know, pot, meat, kettle. But, uh, you know, it's kind of funny that Blizzard bent over backwards for fucking how long trying to appease the CCP, and the CCP just fucking shafts them anyway. Is that because there is the West and East? Because in the East, players are more friendly towards pay to win? Riot can now operate two different ecosystems themselves. And the fucking copium, man. Just admit it. League is a pay to win game. Just fucking admit it, bro. So, even though I'm not really sure if this still holds up because they are no longer ran by Garena in the East, I still believe that Riot can run separate monetization in separate regions. Because now they are controlling everything themselves. So who knows, maybe there will be pay to win, but that pay to win will only be in the East. I believe that's how Lost Ark is being handled, but I could be wrong. Maybe the chances are the same everywhere. And I'm not Lost Ark super pay to win in the, in the West too. Anyway, Riot's MMO seems to be shaping up really well. That is probably because the people behind this seem to know what they are doing. Their player base is ready to try out anything. And should we actually get a good game? Their monetization is ready to shoot it up into the stratosphere. There was also that time they were trying to sell achievements, like not achievement unlocks. You had to pay to access achievements, which was then followed by a separate version of the achievements, which was totally free. So we don't talk about that. So, so yeah, I, I mean... I, I do think Riot's MMO is set up for success. I think they have enough of a massive fan base um, that it'll undeniably be successful. But, like, this massive copium of League not being paid a win when you can literally buy characters to unlock, some of which are, like, super meta-defining, is just absolutely ridiculous. Like, the copium to say that kind of stuff, Right. That's like when Blizzard fans say WoW isn't pay to win because you don't have to buy WoW tokens and you can just grind that out. It's like, yeah, sure, you can go play. Um, you know, if, if you're already a max level, you can go fucking mine do herbalism for an hour and you'll get the same amount of money as a WoW token. Or you can just buy a WoW token and spend literally no money, like whatever amount of money it takes you to earn that, which for some people is literally fucking seconds or minutes, right? Um it's just such copium when they're like, yeah, it's not pay to win because you don't have to do it. It's like, that's still pay to win. Like you're paying to skip a step, right? Like you're paying to get to where somebody else had to grind to. But um, anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.